All right, without, without cheating, I've got an Advent Devo to give away. Without cheating, there are four Advent candles. Three of them are purple, one of them is pink. What word is for the pink candle? What candle is it? Who said joy? Okay. <laughs> this, this does feel, it's not really fair. It's, you, you give it to somebody else then. That's, it's not really fair. She's, she has to like pick the songs and stuff. She knows, she knows. Yes, joy, that's the, that's the Sunday we, our Christmas choir will be singing, the Sunday of joy on December 15th. We would love for you to be a part of that it's, um, it's just an exciting time of year, and I can't think of a better Sunday to have a choir than as we celebrate the joy God gives to us. Amen? Well, church, we are in a series on the kingdom of God. We started it two weeks ago, and I've been challenging you, inviting you, to read through the gospel of Matthew as a part of this series if you've been reading along, we are on chapter, I believe, 15 today. But if you've not been reading along, um, just jump in, start on chapter 15. Don't put the pressure on yourself to make them up. Believe me, you will get to hear about the beginning of the gospel in Advent when we talk about the birth of Jesus. You'll get all caught up. So jump into that. If you want one of the bookmarks that journeys with that, they're on a stool just outside in the lobby. There's a little sign. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Well, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Sorry, my, uh, I'm running my notes off my phone today. There we go. Matthew 13, verses 31 through 33. This is our passage today. Hear the word of the Lord this morning. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, would you speak to us this morning? Guide my words to reflect your truth. Guide our spirits to discern the will of your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand your kingdom more. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, I, I've shared before that uh, when I was younger, I played high school football I, I do air quotes there uh, because I sat the bench on a high school football team. I didn't really play. And I had a nickname on the team. I played defensive back, and the rest of the guys in the DB group called me Stone Hands because I couldn't catch anything. Um, they Actually, we would do this little warm-up where you'd kind of jog this little W, and then the coach would throw you a ball. It's supposed to be really easy. And one time during the pregame warm-up in front of all of our fans, I dropped it, and he never threw me a warm-up ball ever again. Um, because that was my reputation. I just couldn't catch anything. I was on defense. You may say you shouldn't have to catch anything, but really, like we were five feet away. I should have. Well, after playing football or riding the bench for the football team, eventually um, that season ended, and we were just in the yard, me and my friends playing football, just throwing the football back around. And I caught the football, and I did something that I had never done before. And when I caught it, I squeezed it with my fingers, to make sure that I, just to hold it a little better. And all at once I realized that everyone who's ever caught a football does not just press their hands together, they squeeze it with their fingers. I, I went through an entire summer camp and an entirety of a football season not knowing this basic habit of catching a football. And if I had just known that one habit, that one very obvious trick that all the other players probably learned when they were seven, I would have had a, an entirely different <laughs> football experience, maybe even a different nickname. Can you think of times in your life where eventually you realize something so simple and so basic, and you just had this moment where you're like, oh my gosh, everything would be different if I knew that sooner. Anyone ever been there with something? This, is, this happens all the time. This is part of growing up, I think. It's normal to learn things over time, but it certainly feels weird when things are so obvious after the fact. 
I say a lot, anybody could be a hindsight hero. It's easy to know once you know. But how, wouldn't it be nice to know what habits, if you started them now, you would be thankful that you had started them 20 years from now? As opposed to waiting to find out and being, man, I wish I'd done that. Wouldn't it be nice if someone could tell you, hey, here's a habit that if you start it right now, then your future self will be really thankful for what you've done all those years. Wouldn't that be great to have the hindsight today, to know in advance what sort of things would make us the sort of people we want to become? Well, I think the Bible's full of those sort of things. I think Jesus talks about a lot of them, and when we talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom which has come already, but has not yet come all the way, there are some behaviors and habits and practices that go into us living out the life of the kingdom. Wouldn't it be nice to know those things and to get a start on them right away? Anyone else? Is that just me who would, who would love to, to make that a part of their decision now, not 20 years from now? Some of you may be thinking, I don't know if I have a 20 years from now. It's no better time than the present to start, to start these habits. So I've, I've been thinking through our world's view of success and what that looks like. And, and, and what's interesting is not everyone agrees on what makes people successful. There's this theory in, in history, in the study of, of social studies and history, called the great man theory. It's this idea that all of history has just been a handful of really amazing people, the names we think of, like Alexander the Great, or Caesar Augustus, or Jesus Christ, these main characters who have affected all of human history. And so, really, most of us can't do anything with our moment by moment. We're looking for that big, amazing splash, that huge thing that'll change our life. If you believe that the world is made up of heroes and villains and these amazing moments, It'll change the way you view your day-to-day. -day. The people who are just looking for the heroes probably don't care much about brushing their teeth, right? Because it's not about the little things you do, it's about the big things. I think as Christians, we fall into the same trap. We look for star power or the wow factor. What's the big thing that's gonna change my faith? You know, if I could just go on a four-month mission trip to Zambia, then I could be a good Christian. Man, if I could just find some amazing way to serve, like maybe I should start a nonprofit, or I should, you know what, I really, I was inspired by volunteer appreciation. I think I'm going to take up singing and, and get on the praise team. I think I, I need to do this thing, that, this, this big thing, and we don't really like the idea that maybe, just maybe, success is an accumulation of small things, not the huge moments. I have a story that accents this. I first read this story in James Clear's the Atomic Habits. In 2003, the British cycling team took a turn from being so bad that brands wouldn't sponsor them. Most teams get their gear for free because they get sponsored, but they were so bad, brands didn't want the British cycling team to ride bikes with their name on it. They were so terrible, they hadn't won gold since 1908, and they'd never won the Tour de France. This is Britain we're talking about, a pretty developed country. That's a long time, almost 100 years, to be terrible. Then they brought in Dave Brailsford as their performance director. And he had this approach called the aggregation of marginal gains. His belief was if we could improve every single thing we do 1%, we would drastically improve as an organization. So they did silly things, like they painted the inside of their bus white so they could spot all the dirt and dust, so they could clean it better so they wouldn't get sick. They found the exact perfect seats for their bikes. They found the weights that fit the hands of their team members just right. They found the shoes with the insoles that were just perfect. They optimized their sleep and their diet. They made all these seemingly little and pointless changes. They didn't do anything drastic at all. They just made a lot of little improvements. If they could improve everything by 1%, they could deliver extraordinary results. That was his belief. You know, what's crazy, church, is that it works. The team optimized their bike, seat, their bike seats, the fabrics, their wind tunnel, all these different pieces, 
And by 2008, they were dominating the Beijing Olympics, winning 60% of the gold medals. Four years later, they broke records and won the Tour de France. They would go on to win, between 2007 and 2017, 178 world championships, 66 Olympic and Paralympic gold medals, and five Tour de France victories in six years. From an almost 100-year drought, they became the most dominant cycling team in the history of the sport. They didn't do anything really impressive. They just started to pay attention to the little habits. Habits, kind of a buzzword in discipleship these days. One of the most important books in the last two decades on it is a book by a guy named James K. Smith called it You Are What You Love. And he has this ama- a couple amazing quotes that I want to share with you this morning. I think this, uh, if you pull up the first one there, Bryn. This is him talking about how the things we do shape us. Because if you are what you love, and if love is a virtue, then love is a habit. The longings and desires that orient us towards some version of the good life are shaped and configured by imitation and practice. You can go on to the next one. Our desires, this is the thing inside of us that makes us make our decisions the way we do. These desires are caught more than they are taught. All kinds of cultural rhythms and routines tacitly and covertly train us to love a certain version of the kingdom. Our habits teach us to long for some rendition of the good life. Our habits aren't just things we do, they do something to us. He goes on for the duration of the book to, um, you can go back to the, the previous one, Bryn, just leave it on that. He goes through the duration of the book making the case that there's all these things we do every day without thinking that our culture encourages us to do. Things like shopping online, things like choosing the clothes that we're going to wear, what we watch on TV, how much time we spend on our phone. And he makes the claim, this based on psychology and our understandings of the Bible and the Christian tradition, that these aren't just things that we do. These things we do are doing something to us. The way we spend our money and our time is teaching us how to view the world. And he makes this amazing statement that these things train us to love a certain version of the kingdom. The way we spend our moment by moment day teaches us what the kingdom of God ought to look like. See, we may think that knowing better will mean we do better, but we, if you know yourself or human beings, that's not true. Very few of us are taught into an entirely different way of living. How many of us, this, this is a moment to be brutally honest, no shame. How many of you feel you should eat better? Do you? No, we all just raised our hand. If, we di- if everything we knew changed everything we did, we would be perfect, wouldn't we? Give us enough time on Wikipedia and reading the Bible and I will become the most optimal person who's ever lived. But knowing better doesn't mean we do better because what's in our gut, our desires, the thing that when we have to make a a snap decision, the thing that guides that decision is actually shaped by our habits, the things we do every day. These things we do every day are doing something to us. So I come back to our question from earlier. Wouldn't it be nice to know what sorts of things we ought to do now knowing they will do something to us over time making us into the sort of person we feel called to become. If you've ever wondered why it's so hard to take our faith seriously and not become legalistic and rigid, it's because of this truth. What we do determines who we're gonna become. And oftentimes we make what we do the main point, but it's about becoming like Jesus. What practices will make us lean toward the right view of the kingdom? Well, there's a ton of them. There's so many. The whole Bible's chocked full of these ideas of how to practice the kingdom, what sort of habits, our young adult group calls them holy habits, we need in our lives. Well, we read in this parable of the mustard seed that the kingdom of heaven is like a tiny little seed. And this seed, if if you know how seeds work, has everything it needs to become the full plant. All the, all the genetic coding, the DNA, all the different information it needs is packed into this seed. This seed contains the whole plant. 
And in the right environment, this seed will grow into, the mustard seed's case, into this giant shrub that's basically, looks like a tree. There's this crazy image of a tiny seed becoming this tree so big that entire families of birds can make their life in its branches. This is what James Smith is talking about. These tiny little habits that have the power to turn your life into a beautiful tree of new creation where other people can come and rest in the branches of who you are and who God has made you into. If you've, how many of you have ever met someone who's just a peaceful, non-anxious, steady person? Can I tell you that they probably have rhythms and behaviors and habits that are why they are the way they are. You don't just accidentally wake up and be calm and cool and collected. You don't wake up one day and the anger is gone. You don't wake up one day and love your neighbor as you love yourself. It takes practice. And these habits are the seed of the kingdom. If that image of the tree isn't doing it for you, how many of you have ever baked bread before? Could you imagine baking bread with 60 pounds of flour? This is a lot of bread. Could you, this would, this would, your whole body would be sore. If you've ever needed bread, you know what I'm talking about. This would be a tough thing to do. Despite how insane, this, this woman's making this insane amount of bread, and yet a little bit of yeast is going to fill all the dough. And that dough is going to grow and become food for probably more than just her family based on the scale of the recipe. These little things fill our whole life and transform us into something beautiful. So our, here, here is the, the upshot of our sermon today. Our habits, our daily habits are seeds. Our daily habits are seeds. So the question is, what, the, the, the truth is, what we plant today is what we will harvest in the future. So our question is, what seeds should we be planting? I think we all like the idea of becoming who God made us to be. But what little practices, what habits are going to help us get there? You've taken a pretty big step forward just by being at church. This is not just something you do because you're a good Christian. Being at church does something to you. I hope, I hope being here changes you. I hope you don't come in and leave the same person. Why do we sing these songs? Because as Diedrich Bonhoeffer said, he who sings prays twice. What we do does something to us. What seed should we be planting? Well, this is the most obvious and I think therefore the most essential one. The seed we should be planting is prayer. We need to be praying. Not because prayer is something we do when we're really excellent Christians, but because prayer does something to us. It was specifically, I want to invite you today, as I invited those being baptized last week, to begin the practice of praying the Lord's Prayer. My goal is to convince you to pray the Lord's Prayer every day for the rest of your life. That's my goal for the rest of the sermon. Full stop. If I could get even one of you to pray the Lord's Prayer from here on out, this would be a sermon well done, in my opinion. This is the seed I want to invite you to plant. Here is how Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 through 15. But when you pray, not if, you may think, well, some Christians pray and other Christians tithe. Nope, Jesus looks at all Christians and says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Pagan is not a derogatory term in the New Testament. It just means the people that aren't Jewish Christians. Jesus says, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others, people of their sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus says when you pray, not if. 
if there's any seed you should be planting, besides, you know, probably being at church is a pretty good one. But if you really could only plant one, for the next 20 years, if there's only one thing you could get right as far as Christian habits go, I think prayer should be at the top of the list. Jesus doesn't say if you pray. He says when you pray. And then he gives us some specifics. He says when you pray, close the door. He says close the door and sit in, in the quiet of your prayer room in your home. And, and there's a few things we can learn from this idea. Jesus isn't saying if you pray. He says when you pray. And he gives us this practice. When you pray, close the door and pray in, sil- in secret. Go into your room. Pray to your Father who's unseen, knowing he sees you. This is an invitation to have regular private prayer. Corporate prayer is important. There's a reason we pray so much in church. I had someone count one time, and we prayed like 13 times that week. We don't usually get above into double digits, but corporate prayer is important. But it's important that you have a regular time of private prayer. Importance may be an understatement. It's essential for the sake of your soul that you have a regular time of private prayer. And this is important because we must pray when no one is watching. We can't just pray when other people are going to go, wow, that person's very spiritual. We need to pray out of a desire for intimacy with our Heavenly Father. It's not about performing. It's not about sounding right. It's about prioritizing our relationship with our God. And this is why, why are we able to pray like this, because we trust that God hears us even if no one else does. When you go and pray in secret, you may feel like you're wasting your time. Well, this isn't really accomplishing anything. No one is hearing about my need. No one's going to step up and help me. I'm not, you know, I could at least go talk to a friend over coffee and vent. I might get some advice. But prayer, private, regular prayer, emphasizes our trust that God actually hears us when we pray. Even if we're entirely by ourselves, and no one else would ever even know that we've been praying. So when you pray, close the door. Pray in secret. And then he goes on to give us some more instruction. He says, don't babble on and on like the pagans. Remember, pagan's not a derogatory term. It's just a different religion at the time. And the pagans believed that what, how well they said their prayers determined whether the gods heard them. Because they believed in gods who didn't exist. So that when the prayers worked, they assumed it's because their prayers were very good. And that's why their gods heard them. And when their prayers didn't work, they assumed that, oh, we must have prayed wrong. Next time, let's really spice it up. Let's get more excited. Let's add bigger words. But the reason we don't need to babble on and on in our prayers is because God already knows our needs. We're not really sharing news with God. He knows. He wants to hear from us. But we don't need to go over and over. It's not like if we could just beg God enough times, he finally would change his mind about us and decide to love us. You don't have to prove anything to God. Our prayers aren't answered based on how impressive we are. Some of the name it, claim it theology that we may have inherited is is toxic in this way. It makes us think prayers are answered based on our own merit. Prayers are answered based on who God is. You don't have to prove you deserve an answer to prayer. So you can keep it simple. You may say, Pastor, that's great. I don't even know where to start. Simple would be great, but I don't know what to do. Jesus goes on and says, this then is how you should pray. And he explains what we now know as the Lord's Prayer. I want to convince you to incorporate this prayer in your life. So I have a a video, a, a short video that explains this better than I ever could. Would you watch this video? belief that we can somehow talk with the god of the universe which is pretty mysterious where do you even start well at the very center of a collection of jesus teachings called the sermon on the mount he taught his followers a simple prayer to adopt as their own the prayer has two short halves each with three requests the first half focuses on god's purposes in the world and then the second half addresses our concerns in day-to-day life so it's a short prayer it is But this little prayer contains a whole new way to look at everything in the world. Jesus begins the prayer this way. Our Father who is in the skies. So God lives in the sky? Well, in the Bible, the skies or the heavens are a way of imagining God's universal power and presence that are above all things. In God's realm, God rules as the king whose will and purpose are always done. 
But Jesus doesn't refer to God as king. No, Jesus calls God our father. That's a bold thing to claim about the God of the universe. It is, but a key claim in the Bible is that God has appointed humans as representatives and beloved children to embody God's wisdom and rule in the world. But the story of the Bible is about humanity's disregard for this calling, how we make a mess of things. And so the prayer continues. May your name be recognized as holy. Now holiness, that's a fancy religious word. Sure. In the Bible, holy signifies God's one-of-a-kind status. God is the source of all reality and the author of life. And it's this God that calls the family of Israel out from among the nations and then attaches his holy name to them, setting them apart as holy representatives to all the other nations. But just like all of humanity, they mess up this calling. And that led to Israel's defeat and subjugation to many empires, bringing dishonor on God's holy name. But Israel's prophets, like Ezekiel, said that one day God would restore the holiness of his name among the nation. How? Well, by raising up a new representative who will restore God's rule over Israel and the world so everyone can see how holy and good God really is. And that's who Jesus claimed to be when he went around announcing the arrival of God's kingdom. And that makes sense of the next lines of the prayer. May your kingdom come and may your will be done as it is in the skies, so also on the land. Jesus taught his followers that when we love God and our neighbor, when we treat others with God's generosity and justice, we are entering God's kingdom. And so this is a prayer for the reunion of heaven and earth, and we are invited to participate. Okay, that's the first half of the prayer, focused on loving God and seeking his will. The second half shifts to the challenges of daily life as we pray for God's kingdom to come. Give us today our daily bread. That's as basic as it gets, asking God to provide food. Yeah, Jesus is using an image from Israel's story when they journeyed through the wilderness and God provided just enough bread each day. That's a tough place to be, not knowing where your next meal will come from. And remember, Jesus's audience was filled with poor people struggling to get by during the Roman occupation. And so he invites them to join their ancestors in the wilderness, trusting God's provision each and every day. Wow, okay. And the prayer continues. Forgive us our debts, as we also forgive those indebted to us. Jesus made forgiveness central to his movement. He announced that God was forgiving Israel and all humanity for its long history of violence and greed. And so he calls his followers to do the same, to forgive those who hurt us. But we can't go around forgiving everyone. I mean, won't evil spread unchecked? Won't people take advantage of you? Well, for Jesus, the problem is that our desire for revenge just keeps the cycle of pain going. He taught that forgiveness begins with naming the wrongdoing, but then not seeking vengeance. So that doesn't mean becoming best friends with the person who wronged you. No, but it does mean releasing my right to get totally even with them and even learning to pray for their well-being instead. That kind of forgiveness requires radical trust in God. Yes, Jesus invites us to see that forgiveness is like breathing. In order to truly receive and take in God's forgiveness, you have to be in the habit of giving it out. The two work together as one. Finally, Jesus prays, don't lead us into the test, but deliver us from the evil one. So wait, God might test us? Well, remember the biblical story, how God appoints humans as his representatives in ruling the world? That opportunity presents them with a choice. Will they partner with God and rule by his wisdom? But along with every choice, there's a voice whispering that we could do things our own way by our own wisdom. And that voice twists the test into a trap and forces us to decide whose voice will we trust. So Jesus invites us to ask if we can be spared from tests altogether. Like, can I just live a normal life, please? But Jesus also knows that even normal life is full of choices that will force us to trust God or something else. And so when we find ourselves in a trial or a test, Jesus urges us to ask for protection from the evil one's lies. And with that, the oldest form of the prayer comes to an end, short and powerful. But check this out. This is Jesus' own prayer that he prayed himself. Really? Yeah, the night before his execution, Jesus went to a garden to pray. 
And while he didn't want to die, he called out to my father, saying, let your will be done, not mine. Oh, that is this prayer. May your kingdom come and your will be done. Jesus had been praying this way for so long that when his greatest test came, his arrest and execution, these were the words that carried him through. And Jesus was delivered from evil when God raised him from the dead. Right, in fact, it was through his act of self-giving love that God's forgiveness and heavenly kingdom came to earth. This is how God's holy name was restored. So this prayer that Jesus taught his followers, it's a way to make Jesus' story our story. The prayer invites us to daily trust God and to love and forgive each other so we can participate in the story of heaven and earth becoming one. I love that picture of breathing. I think of the Lord's Prayer like that. As we pray it every day, it's, it's that inhale that, of what God's design is for us. Just choosing God's will instead of our own will. Trusting God for our daily needs. Forgiving other people even as we receive forgiveness. Trusting that God will protect us when we're tested. And then we exhale by actually living that out by loving our neighbor, by doing the things that reflect the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like breathing. And I think the Lord's Prayer is the simplest breathing exercise, the simplest habit you could choose if you want to live into the kingdom of God. If you really want God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, in your life, I can think of no better way for you to embrace that than to pray the Lord's Prayer starting today We'll close our service with it. And then every single day. This is not a legalism kind of thing. God's not in heaven checking a box when you pray it. But our habits, we already established, they change who we are. These are the things that add up to who we're becoming. If you want to become someone who in the hardest moment of your life, just like Jesus, can say, not my will, but God's will be done, this practice of breathing in the Lord's prayer and breathing out obedience to the kingdom might, might be the practice, might be the habit, might be the seed that you need in your life, the seed that you should plant starting today. I wanna invite you into a moment of prayer and reflection, then we are gonna pray the Lord's Prayer together, and then you'll be blessed and sent. Would you join me in prayer this morning, church? Heavenly Father, we confess that there are so many things we do without thinking. We're, we're thankful that you know how, how uh, flippant we can be with our decisions of what we keep in our life and what we don't. And Lord, we could never get it all right, but we want to get this thing right. We want to live a life of prayer. We want to plant the seed and start the habit of prayer that will help us to live into your kingdom. And so God, we pray right now that you would, whatever you're speaking to us, Lord, there's, I'm sure there's things your spirit is saying other than the one thing that I've pointed out. We ask that you would seal within us that invitation you've given us today. Whatever seed you're asking us to plant, maybe you're inviting us to pray the Lord's prayer at dinner with our family every day. Maybe you're inviting us to sit in silence. Maybe we happen to be at church today and you're stirring us to be back next week and the week after that and to plant this seed of worshiping you with your people. God, maybe, just maybe, one of us in this room is feeling drawn into the beauty of the mustard seed of the kingdom, praying your prayer, the prayer you pray, Jesus, every day. Lord, maybe, just maybe, we're ready for that, yes. It's not big, it's not glamorous. It, it, if we're honest, we wish we could do something a little more impressive for the kingdom than praying a prayer. And yet, Lord, we take your words seriously and gratefully. That when you had the opportunity to teach us to pray, this was the way you chose to do it. This was the prayer you prayed. 
We wanna be like you, Jesus. Would you protect us as we say in the prayer? Would you keep us from the temptations of the evil one? The things that will try to derail us as we establish this pattern, this practice, the things that will try to pull us away, our thoughts, distractions, would you protect us? Lord Jesus, if we're honest, we're not that impressive. We're not really great at resisting temptation. As the video said, can't we just live a normal life? But Lord, we know we'll be faced with choices and we pray you would protect us from the evil one. Help us to say yes to the things you're inviting us into. Help us to plant these seeds day by day, trusting our future to you, trusting that you will make them grow into a beautiful tree, into a beautiful life that reflects your goodness, into a life that reflects your kingdom. And so, Lord, we pray together right now as you taught us to pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive those indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Church, I, I invite you into this rhythm that Jesus invited his disciples into 2,000 years ago. It may not be glamorous, but I, I just suspect that if we say yes to it, it will draw us deeper. Amen. Well, would, if you're able, would you stand, if you're able and willing, as we leave you with a blessing this morning. Don't forget to sign up for the Christmas choir and for Advent decorating. Don't forget to be here Saturday for that craft show. Church, would you take whatever posture you need to receive this blessing? May you know the God who wants to give you the breath of life, moment by moment, day by day. May you receive this tiny seed, this tiny habit, whatever God's spoken to you. May it transform you into who God made you to be. And may the God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your entire spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Church, the one who has called you is faithful. God will do this. It's in that hope you're sent back into God's good world. Hug somebody, tell them you love them. We'll see you next week.